Hi, Ross. I'm very pleased to have you here with me today. I appreciate you found time to record the video podcast episode. To start, Ross, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and take us back on your early days in the business world? What were your first experiences that set you on the path to becoming a creative leader? Sure. Well, I actually have a little bit of a unique background. So I actually started in academia as an anthropologist and was originally planning to become a professor, but moved out of academia after grad school because I decided I didn't want to do that. I moved into design and innovation and research more generally, um, worked at a design agency and then some research and, and strategy functions at, at companies like Ford Motor Company and AT&T. Uh, and then recently landing at Accenture, where I was heading up design research for the West Coast studio of what was Fjord and then Song, and was also on the business design team. But uh, most recently, I launched a startup called Research Goat, which is mm -hmm. an AI research platform focused on automating qualitative research, basically. Got it. Thanks. Could you provide an overview of your current project you're actively involved in and elaborate on specific challenges or issues it addresses in a more detailed way? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the main thing is just getting Research Goat off the ground. So we've launched the product, but it's a long road from there in terms of scaling it and getting it to, you know, ideally where it needs to be. So the, the biggest challenge is just we're, we're bootstrapping the, the startup, trying to do it all with internal funding and, and funding through customer revenues. So just deciding you know, when to build up something and, and where the priorities should lie and just deciding what's next is the biggest challenge. Okay. In addition to your professional life, do you have any personal interests or hobbies that you're passionate about and how do they complement to your work and, or provide balance in your life? Sure. Yeah. I mean, with any startup, it's obviously can be pretty stressful and just trying to get away from that stress from time to time. Yeah. I mean, I try to exercise, work out most days to relieve stress, I suppose. And then just getting out of the house, going on a hike, going to a restaurant, eat, eating out or cooking food. Yeah. Just things to sort of distract from the stresses of day to day. How do you stay ahead of market trends and ensure that your insights remain relevant and cutting edge for your clients? I mean, honestly, I think it's just staying tuned to what people are, are saying. I mean, I thankfully I have a pretty wide network in a lot of different industries and, and worked in consulting. Just on my DIN, I'll see tons of different people discussing different things. So try and get in those discussions, see what people are talking about. And then I'm also a very active reader. Just read as much as I can from as many sources as possible. I try to read New York Times and, and Wall Street Journal every day, and then various magazines like Wire, The New Yorker, things like that every month. Okay, I think you need to have quite a bit of time as a startup founder, owner. It can be challenging to have time to read a lot. Definitely, yeah. It's one of those balance things as well. But, Especially uh, these audio, days, audio right? books and things help as well. Are there any professionals or leaders in your network who inspire you in your professional journey? I, I mean, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to point to one person specifically, but anybody who goes out and, and does their own thing and is successful at it is pretty inspiring and, and something to, to look up to. Because, yeah, it's very challenging. And when you go and do that, you know how challenging it can be. So, I mean, anybody who does that is inspiring. As someone who has worked with major players in various industries, what common challenges do you observe and how do you navigate those challenges to deliver impactful solutions? Well, I mean, I think it's difficult to launch initiatives and, and things like that, basically navigate the bureaucracy and things like that to do things and, and get things built or do a research project. So, I mean, that's really what we're trying to do with, with our platform, kind of simplify research as much as possible. It's not something that has to go through multiple levels of approval and, and things like that. But that challenge exists in any area of research or building an app or whatever it might be. Yeah, that, that's definitely the biggest thing. What lessons have you learned from your own journey that you believe are crucial for anyone aspiring to reach the C-suite in their career? Probably just a couple things, just 
persistence and continuing to believe in yourself, I guess, and then building up a particular skill set and niche that, that works and that is sort of a unique value. And so, you know, people can keep recognizing that unique value as you continue to move up. Okay. Thanks for the points. Human-centered design and collaboration are highlighted as your passions. Can you share a specific example where these principles play a crucial role in the success of a project or a partnership? Certainly, yeah. I mean, when I was working in consulting, most projects would use human-centered design, utilizing research and various design strategy methods, personas, journey mapping, things like that. One of the ones was working with Samsung. You know, I admire Samsung as a company. They do a lot of innovations and just kind of throw things out there and, and try things. So being able to work with their product innovation team is where you go out and you do some discovery research, you find potential opportunity, and they're you know always willing to, you know, if it's a worthwhile idea, put it in one of their products and, and try it out. I mean, that, that's led to a lot of failures, but also a lot of successes on things that they put into their products. With the growing trend of remote work and distributed teams, how do you think this influences the approach of outsourcing and what considerations have you taken into account when working with remote tech teams? Yeah, I mean, we're totally distributed. We're a very small team and having just, just started. But um, How many of you there? I mean, essentially zero employees, all contractors, and then uh, myself and, and two other founders. So about six or seven of us, and that's design, engineering, marketing, sales, that essentially. And yeah, the team's completely distributed. Engineering is basically located in Canada, even though I'm in Los Angeles. But yeah, I mean, it's really ideal for us, and I don't really see any downside. But you know, I'm somebody who's worked distributed for a very long time. Coming from consulting, everybody you're working with is sort of on calls and things. So it's just very natural to work with a distributed team for me. Could you comment on the challenges associated with uh, the shortage of qualified specialists in the IT sector, particularly in relation to your business? I don't know how much insight I have there because I don't know what I don't know. You know, I'm not necessarily the IT specialist in, in the business. I guess it was a challenge certainly to find, you know, we have particular things we want to build and it can certainly be a challenge to find those people, track them down and trust in the competency. That is definitely very difficult, especially for somebody who's, you know, I'm not an engineer by trade. So being able to figure out who's competent, who's not, it's a difficult process, takes some trial and error and testing. How is your development team structured now? I mean, it's essentially a, an outsourced development team. Okay. So you, you do outsourcing to an external partner? To we do. Team. Yeah. It is an external partner. Again, I'm not a technical founder and we don't okay. have the core competency to build uh, what we needed within the team. So yeah, we work with an external vendor. What were the precise factors that prompted you to consider IT outsourcing? Well, I mean, we didn't have the money to hire somebody in, internally. So that was the, the primary thing and, and just being able to go and, and shop around and, and find somebody who, who would uh, make sense for our needs. And what are the benefits and drawbacks of outsourcing? Well, I mean, the definitely drawback is it's not as easy to communicate and go back and forth, you know, like an internal team member. Things can take a little longer. It might take a little longer to get, get coordinated on things. You know, an advantage is... Uh, like I said, we don't have the particular team internally and we are bootstrapping the product. So not having to have the person here locally is important. So yeah, definitely some pluses and minuses. How do you measure the success of collaboration with an IT outsourcing partner? Well, I mean, we have a pretty clear vision, you know, we have like the design internally. So we know what we want the product to look like, what, it, what we want it to do, all those sorts of things. So we, ha we have that very clearly laid out. It's not just like, back a napkin sketches. So it's basically how well we're aligning with that vision. As we wrap up our conversation, what advice would you give to other companies considering IT outsourcing right now? I mean, I guess just to do your homework. I mean, certainly I get bombarded with um, IT outsourcing requests every other day on LinkedIn and, and things like that. So it can be difficult to know who, who to trust and who's good, who's not. So yeah, just f finding somebody you trust and, and taking the time to, to do so. Got it. 
Thanks for your time, Ross. Thanks for joining me today. I'm sure that some of the insights you shared would be useful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me.